how Bitcoin can possibly influence global culture. Because I think we here, I think we kind of all agree, yes, it's going to be a catalyst for change. But then it's like, okay, which change? And then also like, what is the change that actually matters? Because we, we want to look back at our life and be like, oh man, I helped push things in a great direction. And so then you've got to learn to think about, okay, well, what does it even mean for society to 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 grow in a good direction? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, what do we want more of? What do we got to be careful of? Hey, everybody. Welcome to the What Is Money Show. I am thrilled to have you here joining me on my mission to help shine light on the collection of money. Now, if this is your first time listening to the What Is Money Show, I strongly recommend that you go back to episodes one through nine first, which lays a lot of the groundwork for many of the concepts that we explore on the show. These first nine episodes are my series with Michael Saylor and thousands of people have told me that this is the best podcast series they've ever heard hands down, and that it was instrumental to their understanding of money and Bitcoin. So if you're looking to start a deep dive into the nature of money, I don't think there's any place better that you can start other than episode one of this show. Now, a little bit about this show and how it makes money. The What Is Money show is 100% sponsor based. So all of our revenues are derived from direct sponsorships. And I strive to be very selective about the sponsors that I work with, specifically only using sponsors that I use personally, and also choosing sponsors that have values which are well aligned to the values expressed on this show, such as freedom, education, self-sovereignty, etc. So what I'm gonna do now is a few ad reads right at the top of the show, and then I'll do a few more ad reads in the middle. And I hope you'll take the time to listen to them, as again, these are hand-selected sponsors, and I think you'll like what they have to offer. Today's podcast is brought to you by In Wolf's Clothing. Wolf is the first startup accelerator dedicated exclusively to the Bitcoin Lightning Network. Four times per year, Wolf brings teams from around the world to New York City to work with like-minded entrepreneurs, pushing the boundaries of what's possible with Bitcoin and Lightning. The program is designed to help early-stage companies achieve product market fit, develop their brand, secure early-stage funding, and grow businesses that help fuel the global adoption of Bitcoin. So go to wolfnyc.com to learn more about the program or apply. Again, that's WolfNYC, W-O-L-F-N-Y-C dot com. Turd Amister, welcome back. Robert. What is Money Show? Thanks for having me. It's great. Finally in person. Finally we're Finally in person. something in person. We've yeah. tried to do this in person every time. Yeah. Well, this is the first time we've succeeded. So, uh, And we're succeeding because we're both in Riga for the Baltic Honey Badger Conference. We're actually upstairs in this little interrogation room. Um, that doubles as a podcast studio. And um, it's great to have you back. Yeah, thanks for having me. Great to be here. I, I was walking around Riga and it's just, it's so nice to like walk around in this like organically grown city. It's just so beautiful. It feels like a high trust city as well. Like yeah. people are just very relaxed. Like there's not, it's not that big city feel where everything is on lock and key. Like it's, it's, it's great. I love it. Yeah, it feels, I agree. It feels like a high trust city, um, modern, but kind of low key and quiet in a way. So it's a nice, been a nice balance. I, I see why people like having Bitcoin conferences here. Um, just by way of quick introduction for people that may not know you, although you have been on the show before, you are the founder of Adamant Research, a board member of the Texas Bitcoin Foundation and a longtime Bitcoiner and investor. And yesterday at the conference, you gave a presentation on how Bitcoin could change global culture and exercise and philosophy, which sounds like perfect ammunition for this show. Oh, yeah. Um, so what was that presentation about? Yeah, it was my attempt to evaluate or, or provide tools with which we can evaluate how Bitcoin can possibly influence global culture. Because I think we here, I think we kind of all agree, yes, it's going to be a catalyst for change. But then it's like, okay, which change? And then also like, what is the change that actually matters? Because we, we want to look back at our life and be like, oh man, 
I help push things in a great direction. And so then you've got to learn to think about, okay, well, what does it even mean for society to, to, to grow in a good direction? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, what do we want more of? What do we got to be careful of? And, uh, and then also like, what is Bitcoin's strong suit? Like what is the, what are the properties that are actually fitting with positive evolutions in the past? Cause I don't think history is, is linear at all. Like there's been periods of great flourishing and then decline and then flourishing again. And so I feel like we just, we're such a unique like hinge of time where there's always that inertia where things are just the same for a long time. And then all of a sudden there's a catalyst and there's great change possible. And it's just like, it just is like kind of like, if we can get a few things right, man, like we have this amazing opportunity. So, you know, I, I think it's going to be this great collaborative effort and culture is going to change in different ways around the world. Bitcoin is going to be, I think, a part of all of it. But um, yeah, so so that was, it's exciting to me, but it was also a challenge to like bring it in a way that is not totally boring, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because this sometimes philosophy is, you know, it, it can get abstract or it's kind of like, how does this, you know, what do I do with this? So, yeah. so that was my attempt. Yep. Nice. I, <clears throat> there's, um, I guess as Bitcoiners, a lot of, you know, we often say Bitcoin fixes us mm -hmm. and people from the outside might take the view that we're being a little bit overzealous with how many things Bitcoin can fix. But there does seem to be this connection between like the character, the nature of the money or the incentives and culture itself. And I think it's a very complicated thing to explain actually. It's like, why does fixing the money contribute to fixing the culture for instance? Yeah. yeah. Very difficult quality of connection to tease out. Yeah. Um, how do you approach that with people? Like when, because a lot of people just want to write us off as money nerds and we think, you know, what is it every, to to a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. We think every, the money, mm -hmm. using the money is the solution to everything. Um, is it just a matter of time preference that you're shifting the incentives to harder money, lowers time preference and therefore improves culture? Or like, how do you tease out that connection between those two domains? Well, I guess my first thought was, I like talking about Bitcoin and like how, you know, what I think it's doing and, and I feel like every time I try to understand Bitcoin better, I just share that rather than like trying to convince people of something. Um, and, and, and so, because I, th I do feel like history really is not a given, like it'll, it'll, it'll be what we make of it. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I do think I think I'm basically, I think culture was already changing. I think like even just the advent of the internet and, and there's a few other things that like slowly, like maybe, maybe we had a low in the eighties, like the eighties of the cold war, like, you know, the world could explode, uh, operation Abel Archer. Don't know if you heard of it, but it was, mm -hmm. uh, it was basically, a uh, um, uh, war games that were literally being played between, uh, I think it was like us NATO that were simulating a nuclear war. And then what happened, this is a uh, 83. Um, what happened is that the Russian spies became aware and the Russians started thinking it was real. And so they were preparing their warheads for launch. And like, we got super close to actual nuclear war because of this. And there's a movie that came out, uh, I believe it was a 80, early 84 or something. Uh, I think it's called War Games, mm -hmm. the movie. And it, it describes a similar scenario, even though it was totally, you know, the, the scenario was written before Abel Archer happened, and but it was weirdly, you know, a parallel. And so I've become quite convinced that 83 was like the height of the Cold War, even though some people point at like the Bay of Pigs and like the early 60s. That was also, of course, scary. But in terms of like, you had 30 years of like that tension of like, is the world gonna keep existing? Um, and so I think people were just worn out and worn down. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, I just feel like, and then of course, Reagan came with his famous speech where it's like, oh, I forget the names he used, but it was like Vladimir and Olga have like dinner with, you know, Joe and Nelly or whatever he said, like that, that picture of like, you know, we can all live in harmony together. That the rhetoric was massive change because of Abel Archer. Like right. he knew how close we'd gotten and then the rhetoric changed. And then of course, 
you know, the, the everybody sighed a sigh of relief and then the Russians had their own problems and their economy broke down and inflation, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so, so the end of the cold war, I think was kind of the, the capitulation point of the bear market, so to speak. And I feel like there's been this uptrend since with the internet and in other ways, Bitcoin is part of that. And so in a way I feel like, yes, Bitcoin is changing the world, but it's because of the cypherpunk values. It's kind of like because of the people that are also pushing other things at Mm -hmm. the same time. Uh, not to say that it's not a crazy powerful technology, right? right? Yeah. Yeah, there's you know, a lot of connection points because even that, you could argue the Cold War is fiat driven, right? Yeah, uh, I mean, fair. So, like, I mean, could it could it have gotten that far in the gold standard? I do think you could have created nuclear weapons, yeah. you know? So, so in, in some sense, humanity had to reckon with that somehow, right. some one way or another. Um, right, but the level of centralization is probably not yeah. possible without fiat. No, it's true. You know, I mean, there's, there's no coincidence that Marx had central banking as like one of the ten plaques yes. of communism. Right, right, right. right. Mm. Which totally makes sense when he said, "What communism can be summed up in one sentence: the abolition of private property, and central banking is just aggression against private property." Like, it all makes sense when you really get the Bitcoin lens on it. I think. Yeah. Um, on the first slide of your presentation you have a slide titled history and natural law and you had a quote that i'd never seen before by a frank van dune who said quote natural law in the general sense is the order of natural things in the relevant restricted sense natural law refers to the order of natural persons unquote and then you say concepts of order underneath what a I talked about natural law in my presentation as well, and I know it's something that has evolved over time. What does this quote mean, and what are what's your interpretation of natural law? As it seems? Yeah, I, I can't speak for him because, of course, it's it's part of a, a whole body of work. But but my take on it is that you know the universe as a whole has an order to it. Like there there is just a there's a logic to it. There's a there's a there's an ebb and a flow. There is a back and a forth. Um, even though particular phenomena can look like they're disruptive, like there is always that like equilibrium somehow that, that is achieved. And so natural law in that sense is like, you just study the universe, you study the, the order of things. Um, and, and so if you study humanity, you can also do that. And what he's pointing out is that you want to look at natural persons. Like that's an emphasis he placed a lot. Also Ludwig from Mises is, is pretty emphatic that, you know, studying nations or whatever other words you use for a group of people is you're fooling yourself. Like right. ultimately what really exists is natural person. It's just like you and I, people in the flesh. Um, and so, yeah, what does it mean for there to exist order between mm-hmm. human beings? And uh, Van Dunn's take on it and, you know, many other people in the past has been that it has something to do with peaceful coexistence not necessarily with like happiness per se, mm-hmm. but it's kind of like um, a harmonious coexistence. Uh, Van Dunn speaks about convivial society where people like live besides one another. It doesn't mean we're all friends. It just mm-hmm. means like, hey, you know, we're not enemies. Um, or I mean, actually, you know, enemy comes from the word inamicus, which is like just not a friend. <laughs> so in, right. even being an enemy is okay, right? As long as uh, you just don't escalate to that bestiality of mm-hmm. like, you know, physical fights or, you know, other forms of aggression. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that really just has always fascinated me of like, man, like, yeah, we, what is needed for there to actually be peace? And then, of course, prosperity comes from that, peace and prosperity uh, that is sustainable. And that is not just a mirage of like, oh, yeah, let's pretend for a little bit and then, or or let's let's uh, get drunk on something and then we have a hangover, right? That's even worse, right. all right? Yeah. But what does it mean to have sustainable order in society? What, what, what are the factors at play? Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. I, because, I mean, this, it's like trying to... It's like we've all seen what, to, what is necessary to build this ideal society or at least have imagined it, but we've never been able to properly implement it, right? Just this idea of... Mm you know, where your self-interest ends, where mine begins. Um, 
in the Magna Carta, right? There's life, liberty, and viable property, right? If you could just have these things, everyone respecting one another's life, so you're not being violent towards one another, you're not restricting each other's movement, so you're respecting one another's liberty or freedom, and then not stealing from each other, basically, right? Like that is, those are the pillars for an ideal society. Yet the trick has been like, how do we actually get people to do that, right? We scribble this on a piece of paper, call it a constitution, say we're a nation and agree to abide by it. It's been tried rules. many times, right? There's been so many great constitutions right. around the world. Yeah, <laughs> and they work. And so, you know, to a limited extent for some period of mm. time, but at the end of the day, it's just a promise or an oath on a piece of paper mm. and someone eventually breaks the promise or breaks the oath. Yeah. Um, yeah and that's why in working on these principles of order for a long time, I've been, because I've been thinking about this for years, I've been thinking about, is there a hierarchy to them? Mm -hmm. Like, is there, because when you have like, oh, here's a recipe and there's 10 steps. So it's like, well, I need to know what to do first and then what's next. And because things build on top of each other, just like when we build Bitcoin, we don't start with lightning. We need to right. start with what is the, the foundation. Right. So, so that's been a, a big part of the effort I've done on this. Are, are these, so these concepts of order you just mm -hmm. mentioned, this is plurality and unity. Mm -hmm. for yeah, they're, access. they're like continuums. Okay. So they're kind of like, if you want to judge something, they're going to be on a scale and it's going to be, you know, either it's going to lean more to one side or more to the other, rather than like it's a flip of a switch. Got it. It's not so it's binary. A spectrum rather than a, spectrum, a binary. Yes. Yeah. So plurality and unity is one spectrum. Free access and restricted access is another. Yeah. Diversity and consensus, scarcity and abundance. Can you walk us through what sure. they are? Yeah. And I, I mean, I, I know, I know we've touched on this before, um, but I'm grateful that you're, you know, allowing us to talk about it again because um, there was quite a t there was quite a, a period of time where I had insomnia and I, I really had trouble like you know, concentrating and, and synthesizing things and being, you know, uh, you know, I, I I don't know how 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 cohesive I was at the time. And also I've been able to just do more work on, mm -hmm. on, on tying this all to Bitcoin. And I think back then I was more kind of, kind of an abstract thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm really glad I, I get to talk about it again with, with your audience and you. Um, but yeah, so what I did in the presentation was just to make it more concrete, you used the Austrian method. And and this is goes back in history, of course, where in order to investigate something theoretically, what you do is you create a hypothetical situation. Like mm -hmm. a, they call it a Gedanken experiment, like mm -hmm. a thought experiment. Mm -hmm. And you make it very simple and basic, just like the Austrians, what they did was, oh, imagine Robinson Crusoe on an island, mm -hmm. right? And and then, you know, he, he, he has to forage to get food. And then, you know, he spends, he fishes with his hands and... Um, but then one day he decides to invest time in making a spear, and that makes the process of fishing eventually much shorter. So he creates, you know, a capital goods. Anyway, you can basically explain a whole bunch of basic concepts about the economy just by imagining this Robinson Crusoe on an island center. So, so that's kind of what I I did here, um, and the example I gave is just very simple. It's like a delicious steak, perfectly cooked on a table, and there's two people that are looking at it and they're both hungry. Mm -hmm. And then the, the challenges for the philosopher of law is kind of like, all right, how do I prevent conflict in this situation? Mm -hmm. I have a lot of power. I can change things around. It's almost like a simulation, right? So so what are the ways, what are the strategies that I can use to to not have that like animalistic scenario of we're just going at each mm -hmm. other, right? How do you prevent that? Um, and so in that context, the first suggestion is, um, pretty intense, but it's basically you make it so that instead of two people, there's only one. And maybe he's really hungry and the steak's not going to be enough and he's not going to be satiated, but there won't be interpersonal conflict. Mm -hmm. Like there'll be peace. And that's, you know, like I'll, we'll get back to what does that actually mean on a societal level? And it sounds kind of absurd, you know, to think about it that way. But but at least in principle, it's valid, right? Then you literally prevent conflict by having unity. Um, the next way you could prevent conflict, um, 
uh, I'm trying to remember the correct order because I, I do think the order is important. Um, I think it is the access, freedom of access. So the next way that you could prevent conflict is by having a, a vault or a safe with a plexiglass. You can still see the stake, but you cannot access it. So you, you remove the ability for the two people to access the stake. And then it becomes absurd to have a fight over it, right? And just like if you're wandering in the desert, you're fantasizing, oh, what if we had a stake? Wouldn't that be amazing? You know, you're you're sharing a story. Like there's not going to be a conflict. Um, so so restriction of access is a really powerful way to prevent. And we do it all the time, right? I mean, you 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 something that's precious to you, you put it in your room and you lock the door. Like, right. You know, it's literally, and of course, lots of ties with Bitcoin there, right? And sure. that's you know, cyberpunk, even privacy yeah. as well as you yeah. restricts access to information. Yeah. Um, so incredibly powerful way to prevent conflict. And then you can imagine like, all right, well, what if we have the two people there? There's not one, there's two. They both have access to the stake. Um, what other way can we prevent conflict? And then you can start thinking, well, what if there's a way that we can get them to somehow agree to have the same desire? channel the desire in a way that without coercion because you you you, um, you destroy the basis for humanity and the philosophy of law is all about studying natural human beings so if you if you uh, revert someone to an animal by caging them or torturing them or threatening them with a gun you know you're not studying humans anymore you're studying a mammal right, right? so so right. it's really important that you refrain from coercion in these scenarios mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. So the study, uh, so what you can do is, how can you facilitate that they have the same opinion? Basically invite them to have a discussion and, and negotiate. And so maybe they'll decide like, oh, yeah, let's just each have half of the steak. <laughs> Simple enough. Or one guy can be like, hey, you know what? I'll go find some food somewhere else. You go ahead and have the steak. So both agree that person B is going to have the steak. There's a lot of scenarios, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, so coming to a consensus and that, that's the word, right? And you, you go from diversity of opinion to a consensus. Mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes the consensus can be to just agree to disagree and not do anything, which in Bitcoin we see all the time, right? right? Somebody wants to change the code and people are like, eh, sorry, not today. Let's just keep it the way it is. Mm -hmm. Or in a marriage, it happens all the time. Right? You don't always agree. Um, so Agree to disagree is really powerful because people often think like, oh, but consensus means like kumbaya, we have to right. agree on everything. It's like, you, no, it's more a meta thing. Yeah. Mm. So, so and you can go even further, right? I mean, I'm, I'm happy to pause here. but No, no, no. Was yeah. like scarcity and abundance was the last. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You can go even further and be like, okay, two people, they both have access to the stake. It's right there. Um, mm. They have different opinions. Mm -hmm. You you have a lot of power. You cannot coerce them, but you have a lot of power. What can you do to prevent conflict? Well, mm. just make sure there's 20 stakes on that table. Mm. Right? They're, they're going to eat to their you know heart's delight, heart's desire. And of course, it's not going to be uh -huh. conflict. Um, so abundance is a very clear way to, to prevent conflict. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of like, that was the, the base scenario that I put out there just to kind of illustrate these principles. And what I think is so powerful about this, you know, I don't even want to call it a framework. To me, these are just um, concepts of order that are universal, is that there aren't any more of them. Like, mm -hmm. I, I've racked my brain. I cannot identify another concept of order mm -hmm. that cannot be reduced to the previous ones. Right. And then if you put the four on the table, you can't reduce each of one to another. Like, they're mm -hmm. all unique. Um, mm -hmm. And so to me, that is like, okay... Now we have kind of like four different lenses to look at mm -hmm. people and society. Be like, okay, hey, from this point of view, what can we say about it? Where are they on the spectrum? Where is society on this spectrum? Mm -hmm. And then so if you put them all together, you can kind of have a 3D view of like, okay, from a, from a, like you were talking about, like a, from a cosmic order point of view, from a stability point of view, from a, you know, um, Eventually, you get into human virtues, but like from an order point, orderly point of view, because this is all about preventing conflict, right? Mm. From that point of view, where, what can we say about society? Is it changing for the worse or the better? 
uh, so so that's exciting to me because then you really have something to work with. Yeah, it's mm. it's fascinating that mm. you're looking at kind of the raw materials of civilization in a way. It's like how do we actually build a socioeconomic order that we can all get along, right? Rules that we can agree to, and. So plurality to unity, obviously, you're never going to overcome that, right? Because we're always going to be individuals. Mm -hmm. We're, you can't unify humans and yep. one human, right? So there's always going to be a plurality of people, I guess, is, is the punchline there. Mm -hmm. Free access and restricted access, you know, f that, that seems to me a lot like the communism capitalism mm -hmm. spectrum, right? Where mm -hmm. free access is nobody owns anything, right? Everyone has access to everything, supposedly. Um, no private property. Yeah, and it's in the language, like free for all yes. or tragedy of the commons, right? Exactly. Whereas restricted access is a definition of private property, right? It's like the ability to selectively exclude others from using a particular means or, or asset. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, iCoin Technology. iCoin has just released a sleek new hardware wallet. It looks like a mini iPhone, a little touch screen and camera on it. Uh, the device has no Wi-Fi, no cellular connection, no GPS. It's a strictly physically cold hardware wallet. Uh, like I said, it's got a high res three inch touch screen. It's got a camera for air gapping the wallet. Uh, it's got optional Bluetooth compatibility. And it's a really a, a brand new UI UX experience for a hardware wallet, making it very accessible, easy to use, not intimidating. And as we always talk about on this show, the only way you can truly own your Bitcoin is by having it in self-custody. So you need a device like iCoin Wallet to truly own your Bitcoin. Go to iCoinTechnology.com today and use promo code BITCOIN23 for 30% off of this new sleek hardware wallet. And then from diversity of opinion to consensus, that's an interesting one too, because it's these are social constructs at the end of the day. So like, you have to get people to agree to play by these rules. They have to enact these rules, otherwise they don't exist, right? Yeah, well, I if he, if, if it's okay with you, I would say let, let's go back and, and do them one by one. Because like, I agree with you, uh, you know, that at least at face value, you cannot mush people together and retain their humanity and say, oh, you know, we got unity, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that's been tried, right? You know, that's the the worst forms of totalitarianism have been to like kind of say, this is not, these are not individuals, this is a nation. And right. it's like a human body and you're just a little cog in the machine, right? right? Um, uh, so yes, uh, and that's also, that as far as I understand, that was also Van Dunn's interpretation is that this is utopian. Yeah. And I, I have a bit of a different take. Um, in the sense that if you can, as a just an autonomous human being, if you can voluntarily give up a little bit, and voluntarily, a little bit of your individuality for the greater good, because you want to elevate the people around you, um, I think, and, and you commit to that, I think that is creating a sense of unity and and i it, it can be like a spiritual thing a religious thing no. but even very simply like we almost everyone agrees it's totally fine to kill a cow to make a, a burger um but it's not okay to kill a human being and the difference is people will say like oh but yeah that's a human being so we are part of humanity there's something greater than us and th that's why I showed the Tower of Babel as the opposite of like the the um, uh, the the opposite scenario where everyone is just doing their own thing and yeah. nobody's understanding and is not aware of that the other um, and um, I think also like sociopaths are often like that they act as if there is nothing beyond the ego like beyond themselves so so and that's kind of what I I when I read about early Christianity that's kind of what I see there where people say for example. We're no longer like the Romans and, and they, they, they always swear, right? They always like, oh, I swear this and I swear that. And they're often lying. They're just doing it to keep up appearances, to not get a fine, to not get punished. Yeah. We care about the truth. You know, we're not going to just swear on everything. We're just going to speak our minds. And that is something that in order to do that, you have to give up a little bit of your individual self-interest and sometimes suffer the consequences hmm. because you want to elevate, you know, your community or humanity in general, right? 
So to me, that kind of goodwill is even prior to the idea of the property rights and like mm -hmm. building great technology because mm -hmm. why are you doing it? What is, you know, why would you, like all these open source developers, why invest all that time to build a tool for humanity that maybe you'll be like, you know, a little Moses, like you'll never see the promised land. Yeah. So, so that to me is like, there is something there that is foundational to me, that, that sense of like belonging and it has to be voluntary. Like and that's the, because a lot of despots have been trying to like fabricate that. Right. Um, and then, but then you get tribalism, right. That yeah. is not actually a greater good. Then you're just fighting one group, pitting one group against another. Right. Mm. That's interesting. So mm. yeah, what you said that originally, I was thinking like physically you can't turn these 8 billion individual humans into one human. So yeah. they'll never solve the stake problem that way. But you're saying it's more it's something more like consensus, right? Where you're getting mm. people to mm. consent to being part of a unity, right? They're proclaiming themselves to be a member of a nation or group mm. or whatever it may be. Um, so the unity is somewhat of a social consensus, not a physical it depends. amalgamation. It depends. Yeah, it depends how you talk about it. To me, if you... Because to me, there there is a case to be made that this this whole theory can be applied to um, um, like individual growth, like it's a, when you grow as a person. Right. So to me, this phase I equate it with um, more like a surrendering, like more like how you know a little baby is powerless, but it's also blissful, mm -hmm. you know, and it's it just kind of accepts that it's powerless and it's it's just part of the world and there is no real separation between right. it and the rest right and so to me this is it's it's a very like um kind of like a yeah kind of like a i, I don't even want to say spiritual it's basically not a cerebral thing right it's not a thing that has to do with because to me consensus is very much about you know you're growing up as an adult you you have that sense of or autonomy it has to do with courage, you know, right, like speaking right. up for your mind against going against the grain, um, speaking for your own self-interest. And so there, there's, I'm, I'm still working on fleshing it out because I think it's so important that there is a clear delineation between these concepts that yeah. we don't, because I agree, the, these are the two concepts, like consensus and unity are the ones that seem to be the closest to, but can we just fold them together and have one instead of... Too. But you're saying it's more like, so diversity of opinion to consensus is more something that's reached rationally. Yeah. Whereas plurality and unity is more like just your ego, right? Like the, the baby has almost no ego, right? They're just yeah. part of the world. Right. Then as they start to develop a sense of self and physical awareness of their boundaries of their body, they become, they develop an ego, right? So they yeah. start to think I am separate. Yeah. I am separate from the other child, from the other place, et cetera. Yeah, and, and this is some of the challenge of, I think, our modern world. Like, we learn to think very binary, but yeah. I think it can be true. It's a continuum. Well, or I think sometimes different things, seemingly opposite things, can both be true at the same time. Yeah. So I think it can be true that we, as like, whatever calendar tacky as it sounds, or, you know, whatever Buddhist guru tacky as it sounds, like, we are one yeah. can be very true yeah. as well as we are all natural persons who have our own autonomy. Like yes. both those realities can be true. And realizing that in the natural sense, like when in just in the, even like, you know, it doesn't matter even exists, right? I mean, like, you know, if you go to quantum physics, it's like we're just all energy right. in a room, right? Yeah. So, so that's it. You know, surrendering to that truth. I think is kind of foundational because otherwise you're almost always at war with everybody else or like you try and like keep, you know, yes. you keep yourself safe from, from the outside world that's trying to attack you instead of being like, I'm just part of nature. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's the level of analysis or the context that determines the truthfulness of the, of the statement or the description in a way. Cause like we are individuals, there's a physical boundary, right? And at one level of analysis, I can sit here across the table from you. I'm a distinct entity, as are you. Yeah. For purposes of having this conversation, for purposes of having private property rights, for purposes of voting, you know, all these different things. But in the sense of quantum <clears throat> mechanics, as you're describing, there's a lot of continuity between yeah. us, right? Like yeah. The, the energies that are between yeah. us, the room, and all that. So even 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 when you think about 
Because we like when we think about the Bitcoin network, like yeah. all these nodes, well, every node is separate from another, but there is a unity in the sense that they all run the same code. Exactly. So to the they'll extent that the you language. and I, you and I grew up, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like you know, speaking a similar language or the cultural blueprint. Is, yes. is There's a lot of similarities there. Right. So in that sense, there is already even in the non woo woo spiritual yeah. sense, like there is that unity there. Like we we share that blueprint. There's a great book called Inventing the Individual, I think you'd really like. And it talks a lot about that kind of latent cultural programming or cultural blueprint yeah. you described. Is it about the Middle Ages? It's about Christ, actually. And so before Christ, the individual did not exist as mm. a social entity. It was all about the family, mm. you know, mm. the p- paterfamilias. And, you know, the primary social unit was the family, basically. The father was the head of the household. He owned everyone in the family. He yeah. do with him as he pleased. And it's in the word, right? Unit, like yeah, unity. Exactly. Yeah, unit, yeah. exactly. And post Christ, the whole world shifted towards an individualized uh, mm. worldview, right? Where the, the individual is the primary social unit. And so that interesting. We, and also like the individual, like that they would value, they would have like slaves as members of the church. Exactly. Like early on. Right. That was like Right. And then know. Christianity was a huge contributor to abolishing slavery in the US. And, yeah. You know, all that. So it's just an interesting thing where like religions and mythology, you could say more generally, kind of feeds the latent cultural programming. And then we, we it's so latent that we don't even, we take it completely for granted that yeah. we can be born and I can go own something and I have, an, I, I have a name and I have an identity. I can open a bank account. Like all of these things that we're like, oh, of course the individual can do that. But 2000 years ago, that didn't exist, right? It was just the dad could do all of that. The family could do none of it. Uh, you know, the firstborn would get all the inheritance, for instance. Yes. If you if you chopped it up over multiple kids at each generation by like three generations, everyone owns basically nothing, right? They get diluted. So they worked around that by just passing it on to the next hmm. male heir, and it was always the family that, that did that. So I don't, it's just interesting to think that how much there is beneath the surface, mm-hmm. right? So Absolutely. I, I'm becoming more, yeah, more and more aware of that, and I... I feel kind of humbled, you know, yeah. sometimes you think like, oh, I've got a lot figured out. And then all of a sudden it's like, whoa, there's like whole, this whole new dimension. I had no idea. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. Mm-hmm. You have this, we'll, we'll put this in the video. It's uh, a table basically. So you've got your concepts of order mm-hmm. on the left column, unity, restriction of access, consensus, abundance. And then you have across the top, early stage fiat culture, late stage fiat culture, early Bitcoin culture, high Bitcoin culture. Mm-hmm. And it's how, I, I guess you're rating how each of these appear in these different cultural yeah. uh, stages. Can you tell me what that table is about? Sure, yeah. Uh, I think in order to to be able to be accurate, I think we do need to touch briefly on the abundance beauty because mm-hmm. we talked about it before oh, recording. Yeah, yes, yeah. Right? Because I think that the consensus versus diversity is quite intuitive. Yeah, it's like um, uh, basically it doesn't mean that you just disagree. Like it doesn't mean avoiding all disagreement. It just means like being able to agree to disagree. Mm-hmm. Did we say that before the video? I think so. Yeah. yeah. Well, so to me, like the the model society of like a consensus society, counterintuitively, is like ancient Greece. Okay. Like every it was like herding cats. Everybody was all over the place. Debate everywhere. So seemingly it's like, no, 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 that's, that's disagreement. Like, what are you talking about? But the, the, the meta agreement was we, we just don't kill each other over disagreements. Like we can no. just be peaceful together. So to me, the ancient Greeks is like, bang, like that's that, that level. And then abundance, that's really paradoxical, right? It's like, how do you even achieve abundance in, um, and the sense in reality, because all the Austrians agree, and I think it's true, that human needs are infinite. And then we have mimesis, right. uh, or mimetic desire, mm-hmm. where if you want a thing, well, now I want the same thing. Right. And then you get the thing, and you become more ambitious, and so everybody, it, fe- it goes on yes. ad infinitum, right? So how do you fix, how do you resolve that paradox? I think it has to do with how you are positioned towards the world. Um, and the example I gave was, you know, imagine you're like a, a mountain man, like a, Michael Goldstein loves, you know, investigating the mountain man of, of yore, um, where you're in the wilderness and you manage to 
get some wood together and you have your flint and you make fire. Well, if you're too far away from the fire, you're going to have a really bad time. You, you might not even survive the night. If you get too close to the fire, you're going to burn yourself. And so it's about, if you, and, but if you have just the right distance, it's an incredibly blissful experience. Yeah. So fire can be beautiful, but it really depends on your positioning towards right. it. And so fire can be a metaphor for the world, but there's always suffering in the world. There's always, you know, crazy stuff happening. But if you can find a way to position yourself to the world where you actually accept the scarcity and the finiteness and the imperfection of it all, um, you have this experience of awe, right? And, and, and that, so that's to me like actually abundance you achieve that experience of abundance by getting to that blissful state. And, uh, and so to me, in a way you could say abundance equals beauty, right? You know, that, 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 that's, and that's what Aristotle also argued. Like his, his idea of the ultimate virtue was, um, Tokalon and the, in the middle ages and later, they would often uh, translate that as the noble, which sounds kind of like exalted and abstract, but basically the real translation is the beautiful. Mm. So what was the word? Uh, to kalon. To kalon. Yeah, oh. yeah. Shuste. Yeah. Um, so like calligraphy is like beautiful handwriting. Right. Um, and so, um, yeah. And so to me, I just wanted to add that because it's kind of like, it's the apex of culture, I believe. So if you kind of fulfill the layers below, like you, you people accept that they're part of a, a greater thing. People um, are excited and, and passionate about uh, technology and property rights. And there is a healthy debating culture. You don't even have to force your way into the abundance. It's an emergent property. Like it, mm. the beauty just emerges from society. Yeah. No, that's, mm. a, that's a great point. That mm. First point that scarcity never goes away. In yeah. It's infinite human wants. Yeah. And then finite world right so mm. the demand i think will always exceed supply basically yeah in, in in total right no matter how much ai no matter how much is exactly. robotics when people talk yeah. about post-scarcity world and yeah. it's like what do you and you know hoppa makes a great point too he's like even if we lived in the proverbial land of milk and honey where everything was free and you could just wish mm. food and goods and services into existence we still need private property rights because we occupy physical space and mm. we occupy time, right? Like we can't be in the same place at the same time. So we have to have... Yeah, and I'm adding desire. I'm, I, sometimes I'm going to want to be in your seat. Exactly, right? yeah. yeah. And so I, I agree. Like scarcity does not go away. So even when we invoke the term abundance, I don't think it's a... Again, not a binary. It's just less scarcity, right? Working on yeah. abundance is more supply of goods and services. Yeah. Uh, more economization, more prosperity. Yeah, we know the inverse is true, right? We know that when there is abundance or like when there's a lot of material prosperity mm -hmm. or the illusion of it, and all of a sudden it goes away, like the the, the the Black Plague or the Great Depression or even the past five years, mm -hmm. where all of a sudden energy prices go through the roof, you just see the chaos yeah. emerge, right? The order goes away and all of a sudden people are in the streets, there's looting, et cetera, like society kind of breaks down and that's that's the table to me. That's that's just to go back to gotcha. what you're wanting to talk about is is um, because in a fiat society, it it is almost like like a chair with only one leg. It leans on the illusion of abundance really, really heavily. Yeah, and that's that's so uh, crazy because it's the top of the pyramid. So you're turning it upside down instead of starting slowly and and having abundance be emergent. Yeah, you're saying no, no, no. It's the one thing. And it's even it's not even real because what you're doing is you're stealing people's savings and right. are trying to you kind of Phenomenal manipulate abundance. them into spending it now. Yeah. So you have a temporary illusion of abundance, and then oftentimes people will forget about the other virtues because we feel safe. Um, and then all of a sudden you have the crack up boom. All of a sudden you know in in the the, the worst turn in the in the fiat society in late stage fiat is not really the bust of the business cycle. It's actually the monetary system breaking down. Right. And so that's why there's so many negative signs in all these categories because everything goes to hell. Yeah. You know? is, is it is nominal abundance? Because like wages are going up, asset prices are going up. Yeah, there must be a word qualifier. That prosperity. Yeah, I need to think about it. Yeah. But it's not material abundance. I mean, something like that. 
again, nominally, I like well, real not. prosperity can also be increasing in a fiat standard. Doesn't mean it's not going up, but nominal appears it appears to be going up a lot more than it is, right? Yeah. People, you get your brokerage statement, you're up ten percent or a hundred thousand dollars. You're like, great, I'm ten percent richer. But what's not depicted is the diminishment of the purchasing power of the additional hundred thousand dollars you earned yeah. in the past month or past year. Yeah. I mean, I think it's Menger who talks about imaginary goods. Yeah. So you could, in a way, say like. Im- oh, and you wrote a great piece on that too. Print yeah, money I have is like money. creating imaginary goods, basically. Yeah, yeah, and so you could argue like maybe it's um, imaginary abundance. Yeah, right? and then it's already like the, the bust is already in the word. Like right. you know, it's not gonna last. Right. Mm. And it's it's a lie, right? Like you're, it's, yeah. it's an illusion or it's a, a, yeah. an imagination, a projection of the imagination. Which is uh, like a lot of drugs, a lot of like stimulants work like that, where it's yes. like you imagine you have infinite energy, but actually the, the reserves are being future. depleted. Yeah. 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 If you've ever taken uh, Adderall, right? Like yeah, I've never, but I, I I've taken it. You get four days worth of work done in one day, but then the next day is like, you're worthless. Wow. So um, yeah. Fiat is very much like that, right? Yeah, it is it's a drug. It's like a drug. You're borrowing from the future. Mm. And we've been on this drug for a long, long time. Yeah. So yeah, I guess yeah. we're overdue. For some yeah, that's why I, I, in the beginning, I was like, oh, am I being too negative for that <laughs> late fiat society? But I really think, you know, if you look at the French Revolution, which is so bloody, so horrible, yeah. that it followed hyperinflation. Right. You know? So And to connect this back to beauty, that, like we were talking about offline, you're saying like the apex of culture is beauty, I guess, right? Mm-hmm. But to get to beauty, and a beauty being what? Art, mm. cathedrals, architecture, cultural flourishing. I mean, I guess there's a lot of... a lot. Yeah, I would say those are expressions of right. like you want a society is and that, that... I mean, it's almost like a state of virtue. So it's yeah. more like a... Is a mindset is too simplistic, but it's almost like a, a, a the way you've built your character. Mm. Because even you know somebody who has achieved that like state of peace, mm-hmm. they can have that state of peace. Like when you read some of these Zen Buddhists, you know they're just sitting on a mountain somewhere. Mm-hmm. Like you know they they might not they might not have great architecture to look right. at or art, you know, but um, they just accept things the way they are. Mm-hmm. And it, it, there's a reason why that's. For, for so long been, you know, the stylites, like they were sitting on a, on a piece of rock, right? Right. Um, so I don't know, like it's, and so, it, but if you do have a certain threshold of people that are getting closer to that, I think that's where often great art comes from. Cause you have that feeling of like, you have so much to give, right? It's yeah. a surplus energy. And then you create what's in your mind and what you experience starts to flow into what you create. And then mm. there's great architecture and paintings and, that that's kind of how I see it. Yeah. But then of course there's a virtuous cycle because then other people feel elevated or inspired by by you know you expressing yourself that way. Yes. Mm. Yeah. And again, back to, so the abundance mm. thing, right? If scarcity is where demand exceeds supply, there's sort of two ways to move towards abundance, right? You can either increase supply, be more productive, produce yep. more goods. Or you can reduce demand, right? The monk exactly. sitting on the rock yeah. doesn't want anything. Yeah, and he's he will probably say, "I I am wealthy, right? I yeah. have everything I need." Exactly. Yeah, and well, so that's a great point, right? Because because people often think like, "Oh, that's kind of the how we've learned to think in the mm-hmm. fiat world." It's like yeah. we got the Adderall mindset, yes, right? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. There's only the gas pedal, right? Yes. There's not the letting go, <laughs> right? Right. And you, mm. the economic abundance, at least in that. So you can achieve abundance, I guess you can call that spiritual abundance maybe for that sure, yeah. individual, yeah, but yeah. but we at least need the economic abundance, I think, to mm. to facilitate the figuring out or the discovery of what is beautiful, mm. like what how we're going to be beautiful. Even the monk, right? The guy that's sitting mm. in, on the mountaintop in the temple alone meditating all day. Well, someone had to build the temple, right? He's got to eat. He still needs some basic economic system supporting him. Maybe mm. he's subsisting, but... yeah. That's difficult, right? Unlikely. Um, so they just. I, I would argue that comes from the the two steps below, though. I would argue that comes from having that healthy debating culture, and then also protection of property. Yes. It, it, you know, it, it it just. I don't think we have to worry about. You know how people often worry about, like, oh, but who's going to build the roads? And you know, right, all these right, right. worries about 
But what if Bitcoin reaches this stage? You know, how do you make sure it's like there is no omnipotent, you know, right. person in charge? That stuff is gonna emerge. Like, you know, have some yes. trust. You know, yes. how does how will the eagle leave the nest? Like, right. Oh my God! It's like yeah. all that nature takes its course. You yeah. know, let, let to, so to me, it's like, yeah, it'll be taken care of. You know, yes. they, they will be that that material uh, the materials foundation yeah. for people to actually live these and I, I also think that it's often people think like oh like being spiritual or whatever is like just sitting on a mountain it's like no you can be a farmer you know you can you can do labor all day you can, you can have an intellectual job like you know yeah. like i mean like spinoza like was making um glasses yeah you know, like that is, yeah. there's no there, there's not that like you don't need to like live like this abstract god or something no. to 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 get there. No, I think you just need to get into a mm. flow state pretty consistently. Mm. You know, you can do that really doing anything, but it's something that just really absorbs you, mm -hmm. gets you out of your narrativizing mind and just into the activity itself. Yeah, yeah. You know, yoga, surfing, all these things. like these are spiritual disciplines. Mm -hmm. You can do it working out. People do it parenting. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I way back, you know, thousands of years ago, it was just literally part of surviving was yeah. all these things that now we call exercises or... Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then, yeah, there's this faith, right, mm -hmm. that I guess libertarians or Bitcoiners have mm -hmm. and just that nature does self-organize spontaneously. <laughs> you don't need a top top-down dictator or dictates to construct society right that actually people can do this in an emergent way right um and it yeah again i guess it always comes back to property for me it's like just this idea of like i said on stage yesterday do not steal which yeah. includes if you if you consider killing people stealing someone's life if you consider incarcerating someone stealing their liberty right and then taking their stuff is obviously taking their property stealing their property if you just collapse all that natural law again the central dictum is mm -hmm. do not steal if you can get people to actually follow that rule set then we're good we can self-organize and we self-organize in the, the way that creates the most prosperity but how do we get people to do that well yeah we tried a lot of things and it, yeah where bitcoin's so interesting exactly but. and i i i i i agree with you that this stuff is so foundational i think it's the consensus layer we were talking about because like that literally asking that question and us having that discussion that happens in courts all the time. It happened before courts were centralized, et cetera. And that, you know, it's the, 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 whatever, whoever the person was in the tribe, the shaman or the, the, the wise person, you know, you sit together and you work it out. Uh, and that's that kind of like that peaceful discourse, which I find some of them, and I don't mean to like point fingers or something, but just to kind of like illustrate or something. But I think there are, certain kind of schools of libertarianism who miss out a bit on that, like on the importance of dialogue and, and negotiation and that there's more to society than being like, oh, I'm sitting on my farm and I'm going to shoot anyone who, who trespasses, right? right. There's, there, there's sometimes ambiguity as well. It's like no trespassing, like, oh, well, what about, you know, it wasn't clearly indicated this was your land or you right. know, how do we, how do we prevent this? Some, there was an accident that happened because of that in, in, on, you know, these are actual edge cases. Yeah, yeah. I mean, exactly. There's a there's a, a tragedy happen because of an edge case. Yeah. How do we prevent it from happening again in our village? Yeah. That's that layer of like, all right, let's just sit together, try to work something out. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. There's a discovery process that takes place there, right? Where this is like legal discovery, right? These things have happened yeah. all the time. Yeah. We've had these conflicts. Here's how we resolve them. Yeah. So when the next next time a similar edge case pops up, well, you've got some precedent, right? You've got history. Mm. Yeah, and also it's often, these things are often very context yeah. dependent. You know, like what is an edge case in one culture or one geographical situation yeah. is different. Right. And so it's tempting, you know, especially if you live in a high culture where like you have it good and there's there's kind of great rule of law to just be like, oh, why didn't it just do like us? Like just right. take our blueprint. It's like, no, 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 the, the process is the blueprint. Like, yes. you know, for example, one of the things I admire so much about, you know, um, living in the U.S. is that the involvement in the the process of um, 
uh, the, the court system, mm -hmm. being part of the jury, you know, having a say, you know, and, and then, and then it's just so foundational yeah. to, to, to everything. Like it's, it's why the rules became the way they are is because of that feedback system and it's not perfect. And right. ideally you would have polycentric law and you, but it would still be the same like engagement and dialogue. Um, and even like doing podcasts, right? Yeah. Well, if, if somehow everybody had the simple rule book of, you know, libertarian property law, why do a podcast? Sure. Why talk about things? Right. Why ask questions? Yeah. So in a way, you, I think sometimes people dehumanize themselves a little mm -hmm. bit, like, oh, we just fix everything with property rights. And I'm not saying you're saying that. Yeah. But, no, no. I, but but, it, but I, it is one of, the great, yeah. it's one of the great tragedies, I think, that part of why we need to talk about property rights so much is it's so effing foundational, yes. right? And people forget. Yes. Like in the fiat world, it's almost like, who needs property rights? Right. Right. Wealth rains from the skies, <laughs> <laughs> right? Until it all goes boom. Yeah. No, that's a great point. Yeah. And um, because again, it's another one of these things that mm -hmm. it only exists to the extent that it is enacted, right? It's not enough to just say, oh, write it down. We all have property rights. You know, we wrote it down in 1215 Magna Carta, yep. inviolable private property. Yep. How has that worked out in the past 800 yep. some odd years? Like sometimes good, sometimes not so good. And it's one of the tragedies I think of, you know, some, some, some strands of Catholicism mm -hmm. where eventually they were like, oh, but we have the catechism. Mm -hmm. We're just going to drill these kids with all these rules. Mm -hmm. And like my dad can still recite a bunch of stuff from the catechism. Right. It didn't mean anything to him. Right. Because it's not like a part of a, a dialogue. Yes. Mm. So it's almost like the means by which we overcome our animality. Because mm. like, again, to say, what is a private property, right? It's like, I'm just respecting that you own whatever you earned and trusting that you're going to do the same for me, mm -hmm. basically. But that trust, if you revert to an animal, it's like, oh, I'll just take whatever I can get, right? Like, yeah. you got some extra food, let me just take it's it. It's only instinct, yeah. Exactly. So it is this very humanizing institution, but we've had a hard time getting it to stick. Mm -hmm. and, and somewhat paradoxically, the best way we've gotten it to stick historically is through the state, mm. or at least government. I don't know if the state, you know, we'll distinguish maybe between the state and government, but state and government has typically preyed on private property rights through taxation and inflation. So it's like the very mechanism we use to enshrine this institution also violated the institution. It's, it's, I think it's hard to, 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 to know for sure if it was the government that secured things because yeah, so history is written by the victors. Right. And if, if there is prosperity emerging, and there is a party who all of a sudden, boom, sweeps in and monopolizes and claims like, yeah. oh, and then they can be like, we did this. Yes. So look at this right, great right. stuff. All we did spontaneous this. order we created right? from the top. Yeah. I mean, yes. if anything, politicians just love to walk in front of a parade and be like, yes. I love this, even though it was like 30 years in the works and yes. they just found out about it yesterday. Right, right, right. Mm. There was a quote I shared in my presentation yesterday from Ayn Rand that I'll try to paraphrase and then I'll mm -hmm. ask you a question about it. She says something to the effect that the only human right is the right to life and that property rights is the only proper implementation for that, right? If, if a man can't control the product of his labor, then no other human rights matter. So her argument's essential, essentially saying that property rights are foundational to all human rights. I would love to hear what you think about that. I think it's, it's difficult to kind of have a categorical answer or something because so much depends on like, well, how does she define this? How does she define life? How does she define property rights? Mm -hmm. uh, what is included in it? Is it, is it, uh, yes, so, and also like, what, what is her interpretation of the, pre I know, yeah, I know. It's like, oh, it depends. Yeah. Oh. But like, yeah, but we're not trying to, we're not trying to do politics. Like we're right. trying to like, we're yes, out with yes, real. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, I'd be curious the context in which she was she was saying that, um, because I mean I'm not saying I disagree. I just yeah. mean like because she seems to be excluding something. She's like, well, the most foundational is this, yeah. you know, seeming, which could be like either it's like the most underappreciated, or it could be it's uh, the only thing you need, or it's or it's like the 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 like when you were talking about Bitcoin, we have that modularity. Like she's like it's the foundational layer. Like there's other things yeah. needed. Because, uh, I mean, like, you know, her, one of her favorite poems was uh, Rudyard Kipling's If. Mm, yeah, yeah. That was, like, apparently read at her funeral. 
And he talks about a lot of things that are not really talking about property rights, right? right. I mean, he's talking about all these virtues. As far as I, somebody told me was that he was like a socialist or something. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like there's like, um, and I, I do so sympathize with Ayn Rand having like, you know, grown up in, under like this, you know, in, in, in Russia, like one of the places yeah. where these foundational rights were just obliterated. And, and, and so, I mean, it's it's amazing she became such an advocate yeah. for these very basic, so important rights. I, d I do agree. If she means like, if we don't have this, the rest doesn't matter, yeah. I agree with that, right? Because if we take away the foundation, then the rest doesn't matter. But I would not agree if it's like, oh, that's the only thing. Yeah, I, I, I agree in that sense mm -hmm. too. Because if you remove property rights then there's no civilization right it's just because to remove property rights is to say whoever has the biggest stick gets all the stuff yeah might makes right yeah might makes right and so you're total we're back in pure law of the jungle yeah there is no human civilization you didn't say anarchism yeah <laughs> <laughs> no anarchism is great law of the jungle not now i'd like to tell you about our sponsor crowd health crowd health is a bitcoin enabled alternative to legacy health insurance now let's face it Legacy health insurance is an absolute scam. Nobody can explain this better than the legendary comedian Chris Rock. Insurance. You got to have some insurance. You got to. That's an insurance. They shouldn't even call it insurance. They should just call it in case shit. <laughs> like, I give a company some money in case shit happens. Now, if shit don't happen, shouldn't I get my money back? <laughs> So with CrowdHealth, instead of just paying premiums that you'll never see again, you can hold part of this pool of savings in dollars and in Bitcoin through CrowdHealth. And when you have a health event, you can draw against this pool of communal savings. So go to joincrowdhealth.com slash breedlove to learn more or sign up. Now I'd like to tell you about our sponsor, Wasabi Wallet. With Wasabi Wallet, you can receive, send, and store Bitcoin privately. In Wasabi Wallet, your transaction history and wallet balance are completely hidden. Wasabi Wallet is easy to use. All of its privacy features are built in by default, and it works with any amount of Bitcoin. Wasabi users can make CoinJoin transactions together with BTC Pay server users or Trezor Suite users. For BTC Pay server users, they can make payments directly inside of a coin join. And for Trezor Suite users, you can make coin joins directly on a hardware wallet. These features result in the fee savings and security improvements for both sets of users. So go to wasabiwallet.io today to download the state of the art Bitcoin privacy wallet. Um, and to define, again, I like how you went to definitions, so that's where I always end up too. And this whole Bitcoin thing is just really got me so into etymology and mm. uh, looking at language, like you feel like you're kind of looking at the cognitive human software source code, like how it's yep. developed over time. You start to see through the linguistic structures, I think, especially when you look at etymology and you see different languages having similar terms derived from a more fundamental language. When you see the same term used in different ways in different languages, you can kind of start to see through them to the conceptual structure that's underneath it. Yeah. And that's part of what I was trying to talk about on stage yesterday is this word right. You know, it's yeah, simple word. We mm -hmm. use it all the time. It's got 34 entries. I didn't know it was in the, the root was in arithmetic as well. Yeah, yeah. arithmetic, yeah. aristocrat, that RT morpheme yeah. ends up in a lot of words, art, you know. Um, and so in this sense, we're talking about private property rights. It's a moral or legal entitlement to have or to do something, right? Yeah. Like it's a right. Yeah, yeah. And um, I, I don't, I I guess I agree with Rand when she says the only human right is the right to life in a moral sense. Because it's like, okay, what is what are you entitled to morally? Well, other people. And you owe me what? to let me live. Is that is that the, the from right? From a moral standpoint. I was like, and again, morality is a whole other thing. How do you define morality? But like, I think most moral systems would agree that kind of the live and let live See, sensible. I would push back to rent. I would suggest like a thought experiment where my, I am a person who's so incredibly traumatized that I basically 
I'm like a wild animal and I am a serial killer. And well, the, the context in which I live, the village does not have, or the town or whatever, I keep going back to it. They banish me, I keep going back and they don't have the resources to feed me and keep me incarcerated. You know, yeah, at some point you're gonna be like, I think, do I owe everyone to keep me alive? I don't or? know that that one fit. I'm not sure, I can't yeah, speak yeah. on your behalf, obviously, but I think, you know, from a libertarian standpoint, there's the non-aggression principle but well, then the flip side of that is self-defense. Well, so you if you're a serial killer and you killed someone, there might just be. But I managed to, what if I just do it at night and, and nobody gets to catch me in the act, mm. right? Is it someone's right to shoot me at sight? Well, that would seem to violate. I'm not saying I know the answer. I just mean like, yeah. you know, this is like edge case there. It's, you can find edge cases to absolutes. And yeah. that, that's kind of part of why I think it's so important to talk about, like, because because the like ha having courts and judges and and, mm -hmm. and ways to negotiate things in a community, that's where you find these answers. And like yeah. the common law is so powerful, right? Because it it builds on itself, and there's never a perfect answer. It's kind yeah. of like organic. It like yeah. grows like a plant. Yeah, this would be the mm. innocent until proven guilty thing, right? Like mm. that's why we have that in the U.S. Is yeah, 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 exactly. Like your, your innocence is presumed, but as soon as yeah. we can prove it, there's yeah. going to be legal ramifications. Yeah, yeah. In the case of being a serial killer, up to and including the death penalty. It's like innocence until we've been able to talk about stuff. Right, you know? yeah, and establish consensus on your guilt. Right. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. And so I, so maybe I'm agreeing with you here because I was actually going to push back on Rand and be like, well, okay, I guess you have a moral right into life and a moral sense that mm -hmm. most systems that are traditionally moral would be kind of this live and let live. Now, I'm not talking about edge cases of serial killers yeah, and whatnot yeah, yeah. because that's, yeah, yeah. you're now in the realm of- So, but in general, I agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you have to have some way of dealing with psychopaths, yeah. right? Yeah. That's gonna involve coercion and whatever. But uninitiated coercion is not justifiable typically morally. Yeah. But I thought, <laughs> It's like, okay, I guess I agree, but I'm not sure. Because I thought originally the sole human right, like the thing you're actually entitled to, is just the right to choose, right? Like we just get to choose how we act. Mm -hmm. This is Viktor Frankl's final human freedom that yeah. between... We choose our attitude. So. Yes, yeah. Between every man's circumstances and his reaction, there is a gap, yeah. right? Where he chooses how to respond. And that gap can never be taken away from you. That is the final human freedom. And so I was kind of wrestling with that. I was like, well, do we actually have a moral right to life and that we're entitled to it? I don't know. Like, you, you have to defend yourself. If you don't defend yourself, someone might take your life. Mm. Um, but you do have the right to choose, right? You can choose to learn self-defense or you can choose not to put yourself in dangerous situations or you can choose mm -hmm. to go base jumping, right? And put yep. your life at risk and all these things. You can choose to commit suicide. So yeah. I was just kind of wrestling with like the, the, the most fundamental human right itself. Like obviously property rights are important for civilized society, but beneath that, there seems to be either this right to life or right to choice. And why are they potentially contradictory? I don't know that they're necessarily contradictory. I'm just trying to, I was just trying to figure out like what is, yeah, yeah. What is the human right? Like yeah. Take no. all the way down. Yeah. Um, yeah, because also like, you know, is the is it right in a social context where like somebody has to grant me something or permit me to do something or is it like uh, an ability like you know or because um, I, I I yeah I don't know I I I find it easier to think in terms of like being aspirational like in human growth so like because that nature seems to operate in that sense often. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I don't know if I have like a clear opinion. Uh, I, I feel like I feel like I'm leaning more towards the choice idea, because um, mm -hmm. that seems to really be that gap is also what makes us human. Because mm -hmm. like an animal doesn't have a right to life, but a human does. Right. But what if a human really behaves like an animal consistently? Right. You know, then they lose it. Or or like you know, feral children who like grew up among right. animals and they they're part of a wolf pack or you know. Um, so I, th I feel like that choice, that that's more where, what I associate with, with human beings. Okay, so I want to talk to you a little bit about what I talked about on stage, just because yeah, I'm like yeah. still, 
I want to convert this actually. This was my first go at it. And I kind of wrote an outline, did, gave a little keynote on it. I want to convert this into a, a long form essay. So Very that's cool. why it's good yeah, yeah. for me to kind of- Yeah, we're ideas. both talking about order, right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 So order and beauty and yeah. It was titled Bitcoin is right. I went through these, again, there's 34 entries in the dictionary definition for the word right. I chose three that I thought really applied to Bitcoin, which is like, true or correct as a fact. You know, Bitcoin's a truth system, as we often say. Uh, Bitcoin's obviously a very strong private property right, you know, probably the strongest humanity's ever had. And then Bitcoin is is um, morally righteous. Like it's, it's the right thing to mm-hmm. do, right? To support it, you know, you're basically yeah. supporting human freedom and flourishing and all these things. So, I went through that and then I got into the etymology of the word right itself, which went to, I ended up in Sanskrit, the ancient language of Sanskrit, which is very close to Proto-Indo-European, which is like the trunk of the tree of languages historically, like almost all languages, almost all come from Proto-Indo-European. And you end up with this word uh, Rita, R-T-A in Sanskrit, which meant the cosmic order actually. And it's still used as a Vedic uh, concept of justice. And its highest expression was said to be an unalterable system of rules. It's not something that ever actually existed, but it was something like in their legal systems they strove for, right? They were trying to create an unalterable system of rules for everyone to abide by. Or or they were trying to follow, sell, or discover, yes. If it's a natural law. Rules in nature that are just unalterable. Mm. Which is like back to kind of natural law, right? Like we're discovering these mm. moral axioms or principles of, of human existence. And that we, to the extent that we conform to those, we flourish, right? And to the extent we deviate from them, we, we, we flounder. Um, and so I, don't, I just thought that was so interesting. It's like, all right, Bitcoin is right. And you trace the word right all the way back. You end up in this system of this concept of justice is based on unalterable rules and then to the extent people follow them uh they become it's supposed to like incentivize people to be better people essentially yeah so it just all started to sound a lot like bitcoin yeah yeah and and there's even that like parallel where or or what you've there's like a fractal because you know there is immutability in terms of the not just the code but especially Mm -hmm the principles are immutably embedded in Bitcoin. So yes. so that like stability, it's almost like a teaching tool. Like we can see that there is value in immutability. Yes. And like like Adam Back sometimes say like, oh, this is like our, and uh, Stoshi of course as well, like that it's, it's like gold in that yes. sense. It's like a physical element that is inalterable. Yes. And so similarly, those principles you're talking about. Yes. You know, it's almost like inspiring society. Like, oh my God, what else is immutable? Yes. Like, let's go find it. Yes. And what I think mm. about here, because I've had the mm. exact same thought, actually, the laws of physics, mm. right? The, the value of the laws of physics to us is that they're immutable. Mm-hmm. That we can create an aircraft that yep. does things to air in a very particular way. It burns fuel in a certain way and yep. you know, creates jet propulsion so it can move across the sky. If the rules... If the laws of physics were not immutable and they were changing right. all the time, you could never do that. Yeah. You could never build something yeah. because the rules are changing all the time. So there's like there's a there's a analogy there, I guess, to what kind of civilization can we build on an unalterable system of rules? Yep. Yeah. It's like, well, what kind of engineering can you do when physics, the laws of physics are alterable, like basically zero? I was gonna say that's a great analogy. I think it's the perfect analogy because it's it's literally the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, what are we then? Does that make everything we've been doing prior to Bitcoin like that pitiful from a socioeconomic engineering perspective? That maybe mm-hmm. Bitcoin is the beginning of actual civilization. Mm-hmm. Everything up until this point has been like a very rough attempt. Well, I mean, you could say that the, the you know, just think about like the Industrial Revolution, like coming up with like, what is a stable way to to move electric current mm-hmm. and circuits and this and that? And then eventually it was like, okay, what is a stable way to 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 compute? And like, oh, silicon is a great way to do that. Yeah. So I do think there is like we found 
stable, stable stability, yes. uh, reliable mechanisms, and Bitcoin is another reliable mechanism. But it happens to be the one that is going to a social allow us to have another layer of connection and communication, which is literally how we move goods around yes. and how we how we how the market, the global market for energy works, and not just like electricity or oil, but like literally all material and intellectual yeah. energy. Yeah. And our time, right? Right. So it's like that, yeah. It, it's 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 like it's in a way it's just another yeah. technology, but in a in a profound way it's like it's it's such a catalyst. Yeah. Yeah, because if you think I like that's a great point. There's we've had plenty of stable physical technologies. Mm -hmm. Maybe some semi stable social technologies too, like language. Sure. Pretty yeah. stable. Yeah. Mathematics, pretty stable. Yeah. I mean, obviously, if you go back, they were unstable for a long period of time, but eventually we figure out, oh, Hindu Arabic numeral system is the best. We yeah. all use that. English becomes kind of the lingua franca for commerce, right? Yeah. You know, not that it's the best necessarily, but we get mm -hmm. we get a shelling point, something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. But we never I mean we had gold, but you never had it functioning well at the individual level, right? There's always kind of like rules for me, not for thee, on mm. the gold standard. You know, they revoke convertibility for individuals, but they allow convertibility for nation states, stuff like that. So Yeah, and also like like a sailor said, like a lot of energy leaks. Yes, yes. Yeah. So it's interesting to think about it that way. It's like a mm. very stable social technology that lets you build who knows what. Like if we have this unalterable system of rules, what does that mean? for constructing civilization. Yeah, and people often like, you know, in sci-fi and stuff, they're like, oh, we're going to become androids and, you know, part of our body is going to be like, you know, a computer chip or technology. Yeah. Like in some ways, we have been living in symbiosis in that sense with our environment for God knows how long. Like mm -hmm. we even like outsourced work for our stomach by like starting to cook food right. and then, you know, we ingest it. Yes. And there's, there's, there's so many things where you know, you building a spear, like yeah. you're literally you have glasses on your head right now. Right. right. Exactly. Your vision. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, so in, in that sense, it's just another layer to having that symbiosis with nature. Like I, I don't see it as like, we're putting ourselves apart. It's more like just another way to integrate. Yeah. Yeah. If anything, moving closer to that natural law mm -hmm. idea, um, you have this long quote towards the end of your presentation here. Um, oh yeah, that was an illustration. Yeah, I was like changing gears because okay. I, I wanted to, because the, the global um, mm. topic was how is Bitcoin going to influence culture around yeah. the world? And um, the point I was trying to make there is that something you see time and time again is that when there's a new technology that makes a lot of waves throughout history is that everybody, it's a talk of the town. Like everybody yeah. talks about it for right. decades because it's so revolutionary. And so intellectuals start using it as a metaphor. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think it inspires them to create new theories. And other times they already have ideas and they just, they use it like as a marketing tool. Like, oh, you know, it's like this fancy new cool mm -hmm. thing, you know? And so the quote I, I, I used there, the idea was to use something that is not necessarily a positive thing. That is mm -hmm. kind of like um, showing the risks that come with Bitcoin being used as a metaphor in the future. So what this is, is a quote by John Amos Comenius. And he's he's uh, was born in the Czech Republic. Uh, a lot of people don't know his name, but he was actually the, the founder or the godfather of the, the curriculum. Like the idea that you have a teacher who uses a book and is going to show kids images and, you know, and, and that, that same book can be used by many, many teachers. Like that was new. That didn't exist before. And so he had this book called Orbis Pictus, which was like the world in pictures. Mm. That was the printing press allowed that. But in, in his work, he actually used the printing press as a metaphor as well. He's like, children are like blank pages. And, you know, the, the teaching system, the school system is like a printing press. And we can just, you know, print these images on their brain. And, mm. you know, and so you, you, that was kind of the, the beginning. And then the Prussians, you know, also... And added more to that, they had their own interpretation of Protestantism and original sin, and from that cocktail came the modern school system. So I don't think that's a that's a honestly I don't think it's a positive legacy. I think that's mm -hmm. actually there was a lot of baby with the bathwater that was thrown out. Right. Like, oh, let's do everything new. So so I think 
that's the risk, right? There's going to be a lot of analogies made like, oh, but Bitcoin is great. So we're doing this new thing here. And so that's why edu Bitcoin education is so important because if we can help people understand that the principles behind Bitcoin and the cypherpunk ideals and what property rights, all that. So this meta education is so important because it's going to be tempting for people to just massively misinterpret Bitcoin Man. and use it to push their own agenda or just honestly misunderstand it. Right. Yeah, this is the mm. kind of a double-edged sword nature of metaphor in a way that yep. it yep. often lets us, the word metaphor, first of all, interestingly enough, is a metaphor, right? <laughs> is it? To carry over. And so mm. it, you're you're framing something in an experiential frame of something else, right? Like, yeah. And we do it, man, there's a great book called Metaphors We Live By. It argues that basically all of language is constructed out of metaphors, right? Mm. The word understand means to stand beneath, to gain yeah. deeper perspective. Yeah. You say things like Bre she, breakfast, you don't think about it, but you're breaking bring your, your fast. fast. Yeah, which is not a metaphor. She ran in in the race, right? That's like a container metaphor, right? Like she's not actually in a race. There is no, there's no container called a race, but we say things like this all the time and we have, because we're very accustomed to dealing with containers. Right. So like interior, exterior, all this like spatial relation. Wow. Also the way we talk about time, right? Like the party is uh, the party is past us, right? The party is behind us. So the school year is behind yeah, us. Yeah, right. Um, wow. You know, the hunting season's in front of us, right? It's like, well, you're using a spatial metaphor to describe position and time. So it, there's a lot, but, but it's dangerous because you're framing a thing in terms of some other experience and that might come with certain baggage Right, like if this guy is metaphorizing children as blank pages to be imprinted on a printing press, well, that sort of in, implies they don't have any free will of right. their own, right? They're yeah. just blank slate, which is, I think people bought into that for a while, right? Well, especially in that, uh, I'm not sure about Czech Republic, but like in, in, in Prussia, um, they had a, their pietism became very popular, which was a schism of the Protestants. Yeah. And they, they so believed in original sin to the extent that, you know, and, and Luther already said, you know, if, if you let um, the child's mind go free, then the devil is going to run with it. So the idea is that like children are impure to begin with. And so the pietists took that a lot further and said, we've got to break the will of the child. Mm -hmm. Like that's the role of the school so that you can, Make sure you put them on the right path to know the, uh, the what 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 fate has in store for them, what the plan is for them. Because Germany at the time, Prussia was very like a you 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 take the work that your father is doing. Mm -hmm. Like everybody has a role, very stratified society. So anyway, that was the origin of this. People often point at even today, point at like the Industrial Revolution and like oh maybe they say like oh it was the despots in Prussia who wanted like obedient soldiers like. That's true to an extent, but often like the the religious origin is forgotten. And so like if you already believe like children are like dangerous and there's original sin is is so big, they're sinful by nature, then this kind of metaphor makes a lot of sense. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. And then you go into you you have labeling different qualities of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a metaphor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So modularity, immutable principles, cathedral buildings, censorship resistance, incorruptibility, mm -hmm. Genesis block. What are you are you saying that there are certain aspects of Bitcoin we should invoke in metaphor and maybe others mm -hmm. we should avoid? Hey, my, yeah, my attempt was more like kind of like a brainstorm. Like what are some of the, this is more aspirational. Like what are some of the properties that I hope people will be inspired by in, in other areas? Like just how, for example, when the printing press had such a massive influence. I, I think I told you this before, but like the, the printing press literally changed the price of a book from a year's oh, wage yeah. to the price of a chicken. You know, right. that was that happened right. over like a, a little over a hundred years. Yeah. So so all of a sudden, everyone had access to ideas that just you know from from you could have access to an idea that was produced a thousand miles away mm -hmm. for the first time. Yeah. And, and, and different ones at that. And so all of a sudden, there were all these opinions floating around in Europe. And so a lot of the Enlightenment project a bit later on was to come up with a philosophical framework that justified all uh, the freedom of speech. Right. Like, how do you justify that? Right. Like, they kind of felt that it was right, but they're trying to justify it. And so my attempt there is like, 
or my thinking there is like, there's all these like, Bitcoin is going to spread like wildfire. What are some of the good properties that Bitcoin has that we want people to feel inspired by so that they can use it and apply it elsewhere? Because mm. like the, the guys who invented the printing press never thought like, oh, this is going to be used right. later to create free speech. Right. You know, that, even though they were, that's what they were doing. So it's just trying, trying to like zoom out and be like, okay, not everyone is going to be a Bitcoiner in the future. Right. Like people, Bitcoin is just going to be part of the fabric. Right. And so what are some of these values that we think are so important? And so like cathedral building, like the, like literally the, you know, Bitcoin started in 2009. Pretty much Bitcoiners are assuming it's going to keep ticking the blockchain for hundreds of years. So if you write something in the blockchain now, like don't do ordinals or I, I, I'm not saying that, but like there is, the, you know, we're building something that much greater than our generation. Yes. And, and I, it's for the first time in a long time that we have that concept again. And so maybe people will feel inspired to, who knows, build buildings or yeah. build institutions that are there for, that are meant to exist for hundreds of years. Because yeah. wow. that's the way to achieve that, right? Is to, to, to have the intention at least. And to take it back mm. to philosophy, right? Philia mm. Sophia, the love of wisdom. There's some quote, I think I'm paraphrasing it, that when you plant a tree knowing that you'll never live to shit, to shit, to sit under its shade, uh, it's like the first step towards wisdom, something like yep. that, right? Like, yep. In Dutch, there's an expression, Boom uh, planters It's attributed to gnomes because they supposedly lived like hundreds of years, okay. like little tiny gnomes. So they would like laugh at like humans because they die so young. And they were like, if the tree is tall, the, the guy who planted it is long dead. Oh, uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so maybe... Mm -hmm. Bitcoin again. It's a time preference thing, right? Like you, you, you participate in projects that are well beyond your own life, but you mm. do so with wisdom and grace, and you, you can enjoy it, right? It's not about because ultimately, it's not about you. Like yep. it, it's a paradox, right? You know, it's uh, it's all about the individual, but it's mm. not all about you individually. Right? Yeah, it's a huge, and it gives you great individual satisfaction to feel like you're part of something great. Yes. 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 Yeah, I think that's where the meaning, most meaning, mm. meaningful activity in life comes from is participation, right? It's yeah. whether that's being a parent or just contributing to other people, being a, a mentor or whatever it may be, like living life beyond yourself seems to be very meaningful for most people. What did that great philosopher say? Heathenism is a shit coin? <laughs> I think I read that somewhere. <laughs> that's so funny. Uh, I mean, mm. you brought up something so interesting though that so the printing press mm. comes out Every, ideas start flowing everywhere and then they're trying to justify freedom of speech yeah it's like oh well everyone has all these ideas information's flowing widely now we need to almost retrofit mm -hmm. our political system yeah to honor the freedom of speech isn't that interesting how we get there, again teasing out that connection maybe between money and culture or between technology yeah. and society technology really she seems to shape society significantly and that's a great yeah. instance of it that yeah. um you get this almost material dialectic right where we have a, a new tool and then okay well now all the ideas are floating around we need to justify the freedom of speech and then by the time that ends up in the u.s that's the first amendment right <laughs> yep and so we have freedom of speech enshrined in the united states is like you know literally i mean the highest principle essentially yeah it's like thing. thank you gutenberg yes yes Thank you, Gutenberg. Right. And so it's so interesting how you get these cascading consequences in a way. And now, I mean, I think it would be, you could strongly argue that the freedom of speech contributed significantly to the U.S.'s um, support for the internet age, support yeah, for digital technology, so. right? You know, you have yeah, yeah. PGP case and, well, you know, maybe Bitcoin is sort of benefiting from that. So it's, again, there's this chain reaction of like, Gutenberg, yep. thank you for freedom of speech. Thank you, First Amendment. Thank internet. You, thank you, U.S. as an economic success story. Thank you, Internet. Thank you, Bitcoin. And it's like, wow, man, things are connected in such a strange <laughs> place. Yeah, and isn't it cool also that it seems that, you know, based on all the analysis that Satoshi had some connection to the U.S., but also to Europe, you know, yeah. that there is that, that like can bridge somehow. Mm. I don't know. I, I, maybe it's unrelated, but I just, I, I feel like it has something to do with that. I don't know. Butterfly effect or the way, the way history has a way to really just surprise. Always. Yeah. And then, so maybe he took some inspiration for both, you know, 
um, from both. You conclude your deck here with a quote from Frank Van Dune again. <laughs> Law is either natural or not. Yeah, I just thought it was so pithy and 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 correct, you know that. It just it goes back to definitions again. Like you know, you in a definition, you always want to exclude certain things, and so he he has written a lot about the lawful versus the legal, mm. and and they both uh, it's etymology again. Like they have different, very different branches of origins, and so legal is much more about um, top down, imposing, ordering, um, fiat. You know, really, um, and 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 law has much more to do with the. Um, with order, mm. um, like for example, oorlog, which is the Dutch word for war, mm -hmm. um, is uh, one of the one of the morphemes is lo, and so mm -hmm. that it refers to that order. So mm -hmm. It's like mm -hmm. absence of order. Mm -hmm. um, so um, absence of law. Yeah. It's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. So 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 that's why you like him is like well it's like the natural order like order is either na he's, that's a, a way another way to say it right order is either natural or it's not mm. like you follow the natural order and then we say it in in the bitcoin space all the time like if you roll your own crypto you're gonna have a bad time like don't try to be the the sorcerer apprentice and just you know reinvent the wheel like mm. look what's there and try to you know try to stay within within what nature gives you right don't don't overstep your don't have hubris. It doesn't mean like don't have any freedom. Sure. But it means like have respect for right. nature. Is Bitcoin a natural law? Mm. I, I don't know. And I think Bitcoin Bitcoin very, very wisely leans on natural law. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it's it's a, you know, and is it a discovery? Like maybe you could kind of go mm -hmm. there and be like, oh, it was discovered. Is it a, a, in in some way, I think that, you know, well, I mean, future will have to say, right? I mean, Bitcoin has only survived 14 years. Like how, how robust is it really? We don't know entirely for sure. I think it's, it's robust, but it's so, you know, your vantage point is, is limited in that sense. So I think it definitely leans on, on natural law more, much more than the fiat, you know, much, much more. And did you define natural law for yourself? Because again, I know it's something that's undergone a lot of changes i always for whatever it's worth it's like i love the do not steal thing right mm -hmm. another way to expand on that is life liberty property leave people alone kind of thing yeah um leave people alone as in don't coerce i'm not like don't interact with them sure um i don't know that, that those are my views on i would just yeah yeah yours well i mean um a definition Usually what you want in a definition is you refer to the origin of what it is, what the phenomenon is, so the genus. Um, you refer to the specific, I forget what it's technically called, the specific differences. So it's like, okay, this animal species is part of the general family of these animals, but what sets this animal apart is these particular traits that are not in the other ones. So mm -hmm. that specific differences and then you can also in the definition i think that's maybe even enough but you can also say something about um the unique traits like the yeah. unique uh, characteristics of the phenomenon um so yeah if i wanted to try and define natural law it's in in some way it's in the word right i mean natural yeah. like the origin of law has to come from nature so that's probably the genus and then, because a lot of words actually are definitional in themselves, mm -hmm. you know, and then it could be like, law is like the order. So it's like the order that comes from nature. Maybe it's already there, right? It's more about explaining and interpreting yeah. what the word is. Um, but, but I have to think about it more. I, I've never yeah. tried to actually define it. Yeah, it's fun. It's interesting how it's something that we just, we struggle with, right? Like to try and define what is this order that comes from nature? How do we emulate that order basically in, yeah in the so uh, the social layer right yeah yeah the socioeconomic layer yeah and then so like maybe the specific characteristics are more what you were mentioning mm -hmm. the thing that you know then that's more that gets more into the description i'm mm -hmm. like you know you're trying to elaborate yeah i mean just to 
show by example. Like for example, X X Y Z. Yeah. Um, I like your analogy too, where you're talking about speciation in a way, right? And biology, or yeah. there are distinctive qualities that make this animal a reptile or this animal a mammal. You know, yeah. these different categories. But it's, it's like in that spirit, what reptiles lay eggs, mammals breastfeed their young, yeah. ducks have bills. This is like our nice, clean biological categorization, and then along comes a platypus, right? Yeah, the thing's got a bill. It's, it lays eggs and it breastfeeds its young. Yeah, yeah. And so the, it's just again the language and classification and reduction. Like nature's always going to throw you some curveball, and it's uh, yeah. That's where humility comes in, right? You got to just be willing to roll with the punches. No, absolutely. Yeah, because because our our language is is a limited tool. Like, yeah. We just have to be yeah humble. Like we can. We can only, what is it? You can only like point at God, but you can't actually understand all of right, it. Right, right, right. Um, yeah. yeah, but at least language really gives us, I don't know, it's, it, it gives us a sense of direction. It, it gives us a, even just the, purely the satisfaction, like the awe that you experience when you feel like you're getting a little closer to the truth. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, wonderful. Yeah, it is wonderful. Mm. This conversation has been wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> it has been for me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, always enjoy talking to you. Um, is this going to be a written piece as well, or is this just a standalone presentation? It should be. You know, this is kind of me coming out of the closet with this stuff because I've I only had talked about it with you once, and uh, man, where else have I? Well, you were writing a piece at that time, though, weren't you? I, I have drafts. You know, okay. I've never published. I've always kind of gone back and started over and, and yeah. started over and. Um, but um, at some point, I think it should be a piece. Yeah, I'd, although I think we covered a bunch of it here. Yeah, and I think I think I'm still working on because there's one thing to have ideas, but there's another. Is it going to be a writing project? I like to have like a specific goal, and yeah. right now I'm still kind of not sure. Uh, but yeah, it should be a piece. Well, I hope mm -hmm. it ends up being, and I hope you keep writing because you're a great writer. Um, we'll link to all your work in the show notes. Yeah. Um, where can people find you on the internet? Yeah, I would just say um, Google my name and uh, and then adamantresearch.com is where I have a few links that are literally just uh, free downloads of my old reports. And there's also a link to my latest uh, report, which is not really what we talked about today. It's uh, titled How to Position for the Bitcoin Boom. It's it's much more of a just a, a very pragmatic look at the markets and, and why I'm very bullish on Bitcoin for the moment. Awesome. Yeah. Sure. Thanks so much, man. Pleasure.